So this is our last lesson in the series. Lesson number 12, Book of Ephesians, last lesson in the series. And we'll take a look at one last, one last go around on the outline to the, to the series that we've been doing. One last look at the outline of the letter to the Ephesians. Try to summarize what this letter is about. If someone asks you, so what's Ephesians is, what is Ephesians about? And very briefly, it is about Paul writing a letter to a church. And in this letter, he describes the blessings that God has prepared for the church. The marvelous blessings from before the creation of the world that he had reserved for those who are in Christ Jesus. He talks about these and he offers thanks to God for these blessings. And after he's done that, he goes on to explain that these blessings are available not only for Jews, but also for Gentiles. That was part of the plan, if you wish, that no one knew, that the blessings would be available to everyone. And then he finishes his letter by outlining the response or the obligations that God seeks from the church because of these blessings. So God has given you these blessings, you know, part of the letter is that, and then the other part of the letter is, and this is what God uh, uh, expects from you in response to these blessings. So our last few weeks have been spent on describing these obligations or this response from the church. And we said that the church must maintain unity to begin with. God expects us to maintain, preserve, to work at maintaining the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Also by holding to the elements of unity given by God, you know, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and so on and so forth. Another uh, response of the church that he describes is that the church must live righteously. And again, he kind of deconstructs this idea of righteousness, living righteousness. Uh, this is seen in a loving attitude, a holy and pious lifestyle, and so on and so forth. And then last of all, he talks about being faithful, the other response that God requires of those who receive his blessing, and that is the response of faith. He expects us to be faithful. So in chapter six, we, we look at the enemy in the battle. In the final section of his letter, Paul will use the image of a Roman soldier to explain how the Christians are to remain faithful. Now this is interesting because it, it, it's a departure from the style of writing that's in the rest of this letter. Because until chapter six, he explains in theological terms and practical terms the life and the responsibility of Christians towards God. But then in chapter six, he finishes his letter with high imagery, an enthusiastic call to arms, as it were, to rally the church in order to remain faithful. It's like blowing the bugle, you know. A call to arms to remain faithful, and he does this uh, by using a, a, an image of a Roman soldier prepared for battle. So we're in chapter uh, six of the text, in um, verse 10, that's where we pick it up. So let's read together. He says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. So what's the call, the calling, if you wish? The call is, be strong. Be strong with the strength of God. The idea is, be strong in the strength of God rather than in the strength of man. He doesn't say it, but that's what he's talking about. Find your strength in God, in the things of God, not in the things of man. And he repeats the same idea twice for emphasis. So the strength of the power is not about you know, big muscles or human fighting skills. It's about using the strength of God for the battle of the spirit. And so we continue reading verse 11, 12 and 13. He says, put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, 
against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand, to stand firm. So in these verses, Paul explains why it is the strength of God that is necessary. You have to be strong with the strength of God because the enemy is not human. The enemy is spiritual in nature. Now the readers would have understood the imagery of full armor to refer to the Roman line soldier, the fully armed legionnaire on whom Rome depended for their, you know, for their conquering of other nations. In the same way that these soldiers were fully covered, Paul says that Christians should be fully covered with God's armor. This is the strength that he talks about that God provides for us. There's no mystery about it. You know, so many people thinking there's a, some sort of mystery to spiritual strength, spiritual action. No mystery, he describes it. Paul says that once you're covered, the Christian needs to stand firm. Another English word, be immovable, be invincible against the expert attack of the enemy because he's not a mere man, he's the devil himself. So Paul describes the battle as a struggle which suggests hand-to-hand -hand combat. No long range artillery here, everybody on the line face-to-face -face with the enemy. No ordinary wrestling match where you, know, you lose points but a but really a hand-to-hand -hand struggle of life and death, which reminds me of a scene that just, you know, see some movies, certain scenes, they just stay with you. I remember a movie called Saving Private Ryan with Tom Hanks, a lot of people saw that movie. And in that movie, there is a fight scene between an American soldier and a German soldier. And the fight scene takes place inside of a bell tower. Can you imagine the restrictive space in a, bell, in a small bell tower. And they don't, have any, they don't have any guns or anything. They're out of bullets or you know, the, the, they, they don't have guns. And they are fighting hand to hand. And it's one of the best, most realistic fight scenes that I've ever seen. None of this uh, Jean-Claude Van Damme, you know, high kick in karate, none of that stuff. Two guys fighting for their lives, grabbing, biting, punching, scratching, just to and in the end, the German soldier who is bigger in stature, he's a bigger man, heavier man, finally overpowers the smaller American man. He's on top of him with a knife and he's wanting to stab him. And the, and the American is holding his hand you know, like this. And I remember just the last scene, so chilling, the German goes, shh, 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 quiet. And then he stabs him and kills him. So cold-blooded, war. And it reminded me in that scene that war is not like Hollywood makes it, you know, a, a kind of bloodless, one man against 25, you know, a bomb explodes next to him and he just rolls over and gets up and keeps running. That scene reminded me that war is brutal. It's savage. The enemy is trying to kill you and you're trying to kill your enemy. In the same way, the spiritual battle has been portrayed, you know, with the devil as a, some sort of guy in Wall Street with a nice suit, you know, or something like that. When in reality, the battle is savage because the objective is to destroy the soul of the individual, destroy their eternal life. And so Paul is talking about this battle, this hand-to-hand -hand combat, this savage war that is taking place in the spirit, and he has two views of the same enemy. Some people try to parse these and try to make up different characters. Just two, it's two views of the same person. Evil rulers, powers, forces led by Satan, and huge members of wicked spirits, same thing. So the exhortation is to put on all of God's armor because human strength cannot prevail against such an enemy. In the end, just like in the movie fight, the last one standing will be the victor. Now there'll be a battle, and it'll be a battle to death, and you will be in that battle, he says, but if you remain standing, and here read the word faithful, if you remain faithful, in the end, 
you have the victory. And unfortunately, so many people in the church, so many Christians think they confuse the word faithful with perfect. Paul never says, and if you remain perfect, no mistakes, no mess ups, no, no tripping over, no doing of stupid things, no dis that's not what he says. He doesn't say, and if you remain perfect, he says, if you remain faithful, despite the imperfection, despite the mistakes, if you just remain faithful, you'll have the, you'll have the victory. And so now he goes on to talk about the spiritual armor and he goes on to describe the seven piece armor of the Christian warrior using the imagery of the Roman soldier you know, getting dressed for battle. Again, you know, how many times have you seen this in the movies? People getting ready, you know, high noon, Gary Cooper you know, strapping on his gun and putting on his hat and putting on his badge, you know, getting ready to face you know, the enemy, the bad guy. How many movies have we seen where you know, the good guys are all getting ready to, to go into battle? Well, this is kind of the imagery that he's using here. You know, the spiritual warrior getting ready for battle, putting on his or her um, armaments. And so we're in uh, verse 14a, he says, Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth. Now, girded your loins meaning putting on, you know, putting on your, actually putting on your underwear, putting on your, you know, your undergarments. And for the Roman soldier, the basic tunic was uh, worn as a bare garment or covering. It, it was the first thing on. It was to cover oneself with. And so he says, first thing, cover yourself with the truth of God. This is basic because Satan's main weapon is the lie. The lie that tells you there is no God. The lie that tells you you're never going to make it. The lie that says to you you're not good enough. The lie that says to you go ahead and try it. It's okay. What could, what could go wrong? <laughs> Satan's main attack is lies. And so he says your basic covering is know the truth about things. Truth is the basis for courage and boldness and freedom. The enemy is rendered powerless against the truth. Secondly, he says, put on righteousness, 14b, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, the metal breastplate worn and strapped outside the tunic. The righteousness is the one that God gives us because of our faith in Christ. Notice, we are not righteous. Our breastplate is not enough. You have to put something over us. That breastplate is God's righteousness, the righteousness that Christ gives us through faith when we obey the gospel in repentance and in baptism. We are made acceptable or righteous to God because of our faith in Jesus. So God's righteousness cannot be pierced. That's the idea. However, one of Satan's lethal blows could easily pierce the shield of self-righteousness. You see the, the idea? People going around in self-righteousness. I'm okay because I'm okay and I'm not such a bad person and I do my best and blah, blah, blah. That kind of righteousness can easily be pierced by Satan's attack. But Christ's righteousness cannot be pierced. Number three, he says in verse 15, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. So the third armament is the gospel itself. Soldiers wore foot coverings over their sandals that went all the way up their shins to their knees. The key word here is preparation. The thought is that the Christian soldier is prepared to walk into battle, why? On account of the gospel. The gospel is the power of God, Romans 1.16, and it is the power that enables the Christian to do battle, to stand firm. The gospel answers, uh, excuse me, the gospel assures the Christian of his salvation and gives him strength to face the enemy who wants to take that salvation away. Some, some person says, how do you know that you're saved? And I say, well, I know that I, how do you know? Have you seen a sign? Have you had a feeling? And I said, I know that my sins are forgiven and I know that God receives me and I know that I'm saved because in November of 1977, 
I confessed my faith in Christ and I was buried in the waters of baptism. That's how I know. And because I responded to the gospel in that way, God has promised me that my sins are forgiven. He has promised me that He has given me the Holy Spirit, which will, who will rather, raise me up on that, on that last day. How do I know this? Well, the word tells me. And anytime I doubt, I go back to the gospel and I read over again. Yeah, that's the gospel, okay. That's what I obeyed. It hasn't changed. He goes on in verse 16, the fourth element, the fourth uh, uh, defensive um, uh, piece of equipment, armor if you wish, is the faith. Verse 16, he says, in addition to all, taking up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish all of the flaming arrows of the evil one. Now the Roman soldier had a scutum, four foot shield actually, that covered him from his knees to his eyes and it provided protection from arrows and other enemy projectiles. One thing that's interesting, I saw a, an animation once um, of how uh, Roman soldiers used their shields. It was very interesting how, uh, it wasn't actually an animation, it was an actual you know, reproduction of it, reacting of it. Soldiers dressed like the Roman soldiers, acting out their field positions with these shields. And when they were marching ahead and they were, you know, there was arrows coming, they would, they would form like a column, a square defensive column with all the shields like this, forming a defensive barrier this way, and then others putting their shields above their heads so that no arrows. It was like a tank. They used these shields like, a, like armor, if you wish, especially when they were in close quarters with each other. They practiced this. It was just fascinating. So Paul says, the shield of faith, the, the shield of faith. So the shield of the Christian is not simply the subjective faith that says, I believe, that's one kind of faith. You know, like I believe in Jesus, I trust Jesus, that type of faith. That's not the faith he's talking about here. The shield is the actual doctrine, the teaching itself, because he says, the faith, the actual word of God that responds to Satan's fiery attacks with, it is written. It is written. Jesus used that shield of faith to defend against Satan's attack in the desert. God's very words. It is written. And he says this is an important piece of the armor. Number five in verse 17 he says, and take the, cel the helmet of salvation. The helmet of salvation. The soldier wore a helmet as lethal blow protection. I mean, he could survive a wound you know, to his leg or to his arm, but a blow to the head was rarely survivable, and so they had protective helmets. So Paul has explained from the start that God has blessed them with all the spiritual blessings which include forgiveness for their sins, which includes resurrection, which includes glorification, which includes exaltation. You know that, right? Resurrection, glorification, exaltation, those three things. Resurrection is the resurrection uh, from the dead of the individual. Glorification is the transformation of the earthly body to the spiritual body, to enable the individual to exist in the spiritual dimension, to be in the presence of God. And then exaltation is taking one's position with Christ at the right hand of God. Resurrection, glorification, exaltation. The gospel promises this. In this passage, or salvation is made up of this, if you wish. So in this passage, he compresses all of these blessings into a single word. The word salvation, the helmet of salvation, includes all the things that I've just mentioned. He tells them that the battle will sometimes be fierce, there may be injuries, but so long as they keep the helmet on, and keeping the helmet on means confidence that they possess salvation. You know, Satan's best attack is to try to get you to start second guessing yourself about your salvation. If, you can, if he can get you to start guessing or, or second guessing yourself about your salvation, doubting your salvation, then he can pry you away from Christ. He can pry you away from the church. He can then more easily get you to believe the various lies that he wants you to believe. 
Number six, he talks about the word of God, verse 17b, he says, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. So he's described defensive equipment that the soldier must possess. Now he goes on to describe two offensive weapons. You see that, see the change? Soldier's got to have defensive equipment, but he also has to have offensive equipment. The Roman soldier usually carried an assortment of weapons, but his most basic was the three-foot sword strapped to his side. So Paul has mentioned the word as the faith, in a defensive mode, seen as a shield. Now he changes the imagery to describe God's word as the sword, the sword of the Spirit, because the Holy Spirit gives us the word, 2 Peter 3, uh, 1 rather, verse 21. Man's word and man's intelligence and man's will and man's wisdom will not do in this fight. Only God's word can be an offensive weapon against Satan. You know, they say you've got to fight fire with fire. Well, the same is true here. You've got to fight spirit with spirit. The evil spirit you fight with the spirit of God, which is the word of God. That's why it's so important. You know, we, I keep harping on this idea. Why do we have you know, so many, so some people say, especially when we were in Canada, this, this is something most churches don't do in Canada. Well, why do you people have a midweek service? I remember the church, there was a church building next to ours was a, a, a charismatic Pentecostal church and on Sunday morning, all they had was a Sunday morning service, no Bible class, no Wednesday night service. And the people next door, you know, we would you know, bump into them, we parked our cars in the same area, good morning, we'd visit and so on and so forth. And the question was, why do you people have a Wednesday service? You know, it was like, why do we have a Wednesday service? So we can sharpen the sword. That's why, so we can learn how to use the sword to defend ourselves, to go on the offensive. And then the seventh offensive weapon, we never think of it in this term, is prayer. Verse 18, he says, with all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the spirit, and with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints, and pray on my behalf, that utterance may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in proclaiming it, I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. So for the soldier, the final preparation for war is mental preparation. A soldier spends many hours in briefing before going on to a real war or just war games. They do simulated attacks over and over again to try out the equipment, to uh, learn how to react in certain situations. They want you mentally alert, they want you focused, they want you tough, they want you motivated. Because if a soldier gets careless, if a soldier gets mentally lazy, he could easily get hurt or killed. Even in practice runs, I remember our son Paul once called me up and when he was in the Marine Corps and he said, hey dad, today I got hit by a mortar shell. And I was a, I was a little surprised. I thought he got hit by the explosive end of the mortar shell and I was wondering why he was able even to call me. But no, he had got hit by the shell itself. The, the casing came out and he was standing too close and it hit him and you know, cut his face. That's why they practice so that those type of things don't happen when they are in the stress of real battle. So Paul exhorts the Christians at Ephesus to remain alert by keeping their minds keyed in through prayer. And he talks about prayer, pray consistently, praying in the spirit, meaning praying according to God's will, praying according to God's word, praying for each other, praying for him that he'll also stay in the battle and do his job. So the Christian stays focused and in communication with his commander through prayer. Very important. It ought to be reflex that we pray. Something happens, we pray. Something good happens, we praise. Something bad happens, we appeal. But prayer is a reflexive action. 
And so Paul encouraged the Christians to see themselves in a battle against spiritual forces and he tells them to put on all the spiritual armor that God provides. Do not try to do battle with your own armor. And use the offensive weapons of the word and prayer to defend against the enemy. And stand firm and don't be moved until the enemy is completely defeated. So that's the other part. Now he talks about training methods in two verses to continue this metaphor of the battle, of the war. Let's read verse 21 and 22, shall we? He says, but that you may also know about my circumstances, how I am doing, Tychicus, the beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will make everything known to you. I have sent him to you for this very purpose so that you may know about us and that he may comfort your hearts. People learn best when they're taught by example. That's how I learn. Somebody says, you know, we, we need to do this. My wife is a, a marvelous person who's able to figure things out looking at a diagram. You know, the instructions, you know. She's able to read, okay, we do this, we do that. She's great. I'm not good at that. I can't see things in three dimensions. I would not have been a good engineer. I like to, you know, if somebody shows me how to do it, then I can, I can pick it up just watching. Well, this is what Paul is talking about here. In addition to the image that he's given them, he also provides them with a good example of a soldier in action. A picture, as they say, is worth a thousand words. So Paul sends Tychicus to give them the picture, if you wish, of Paul's battle. Let Tychicus go and tell you what's going on with me, how I am doing in my struggle. With his description of Paul's status, Tychicus will give the brethren a vision of Paul, the great spiritual warrior, wearing the armor, using the sword and prayer while engaged at the worst front of the battle. That's where Paul was. He was in a Roman prison. Could you be in a worse position? And hopefully in seeing the armor working, that Paul is still standing firm, the Ephesians will be encouraged and comforted in their own struggle. And then the last two verses, the salutation, he says, peace be to the brethren and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all those who love our Lord Jesus Christ with incorruptible love. So Paul ends with a blessing. In the beginning he offered thanks and praise on behalf of the brethren to God in prayer for all the blessings. In the end, the faith, the peace, the love comes from the Father to the brethren, thus completing the circle of relationship between God and His children. First, the children send up their love. At the beginning, in the end, God sends down His love. So as Paul concludes his prayer, or rather, as he concludes, his prayer is that the cycle of blessings begun before time will now continue after time has come to an end. And now uh, that the receivers of the blessing, which is the church, now that they are eternal beings like the giver of the blessings, and that is Almighty God. A marvelous end to a marvelous epistle. And so there are a couple of, a couple of lessons that we can draw from this. A lot of them, I you know, picked a couple things that we need to be reminded of as we finish out this series today and this, uh, uh, this, uh, this epistle. First of all, let's remember that these are our blessings. Everything that Paul talked about at the beginning of the epistle, that's for us too. We have all the blessings of heaven secured for us by God. This applies to us. The blessings have not changed. Why? Because God has not changed. Secondly, these are our responsibilities, our obligations. The Holy Spirit through Paul speaks to us today about unity, about righteousness, about faithfulness. If you're wondering, how do I live my life as a Christian? How do I respond? Take a look at Ephesians. That's exactly how God wants us to respond in the modern age. 
The setting is modern, but the things that God continues to expect from us today are exactly the same as what He required of us, or required of Christians in the beginning. And then, perhaps one other lesson based on Ephesians 6, this is also our battle. This is our battle. We have to be strong. We have to remain standing. We have to put on the armor. Each one of us is in the battle line each day and we war against the evil in high places. Some people say, oh, it's terrible today. You know, I hate to raise kids you know, in, 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 in today's environment. Well, how would you like to be in the first century environment? You know, when a third to a half of the world were in slavery to Rome, where most people did not know how to read, where the church was you know, in hidden places and in homes, had no network, no protection. In the first century, you couldn't have met like this, not during the persecution. And you had a government that you know, promoted evil, that was evil, purely evil. You may not agree with today's president or yesterday's president or tomorrow's president, but we don't have a government that is purposefully looking to take over the world and enslave people, purposefully promoting evil and paganism, purposefully. As I said before, Jesus never said that it would be easy. He just said that it would be worth it. And that is Paul's point here. The battle is difficult. Everyone's in the battle, but the battle will be worth it in the end. Well, that's our study of the book of Ephesians. I know that we could go back to chapter one, go through it again, look at, another, look at it from another perspective. Uh, there are endless ways to, or endless ideas to draw from the book of Ephesians, all the words, all the ideas that are there, but this is one way to, uh, to look at it. I want to thank you for your attention in this class.